Thanks for downloading from the School of Christ. Support for this program comes from your generous donations. To find out more, visit us online at www.theschoolofchrist.org. John chapter 2 is basically, we can, uh, we can divide it into two segments. The first is the wedding in Cana, his glory revealed. And the second is destroy this temple, his authority realized. So his glory is revealed in the first part, his authority realized in the second part. First part dealing with the, wed- the wedding in Cana. Second part dealing with the cleansing of the temple when he invites them to destroy this temple. And so we'll talk all about that and it'll be good. So with John chapter 2, we begin in verse 1 with the wedding in Cana. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. (laughs) Now, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Well, let's go back to the beginning here, and I just want to go through and pull out some points and share them with you. Well, it would help if the points were in the correct order, but we'll just, (laughs) we'll do the best we can. Number one, in verse one, it says on the third day, and this third day represents resurrection. On the third day, what what does that third day mean? The third day of what? It really doesn't say. So for John to specifically say on the third day, perhaps it means on the third day after the events that were recorded in John chapter one. But by mentioning the third day, It's a bit of an allusion to the resurrection that Scripture uh, tells us that he was raised on the third day. So this kind of gives us a little bit of a prophetic foreshadowing of the symbolism of the wedding in Cana, that it's going to represent resurrection. Then, as we move on, we see that there is a problem with this wedding feast. And the problem is, in verse 3, it says that they ran out of wine, and the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Well, what does wine represent here? If you look in Scripture, it says that God gives wine to gladden the hearts of men. So wine represents joy. And obviously, if you drink too much wine and you get too much joy, then you're going to be in trouble. But in moderation, wine in Scripture represents joy. It represents prosperity. So in this case, wine represents joy. And when they ran out of wine, it says, it represents, according to my interpretation of things, and you feel free to interpret them however the Spirit of God leads you, but I see that the failure of the wine represents the failure of religion without relationship. So this represents a lack. It represents that there's something that they should have had that they didn't have and they ran out of because they were lacking something. So what they really had was six water pots of stone, but they were empty. 
empty water pots with nothing in them. The number six is significant in scripture. Six represents the number of man, just short of the number of God, which is seven. So seven is the number of God. It's also the number of divine perfection. Six is the number of man coming up just short of the glory of God. And isn't that the case with all men? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So these six water pots of stone are empty and they must be filled in order to fulfill their purpose. And just like those empty water pots, man apart from God and apart from the life of God, being six in number, falling short of the glory of God and falling short of the divine perfection in and of his own self. So there it it says was set six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece and yet they were empty. So Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And that's when a miracle happened. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And what happened? The water had been turned into wine. Now, the comment in verse 10 is very significant, I think, because it speaks again to this parable of Six representing the number of man, man coming up short, they have no wine. And then Jesus orders that the pots should be filled with water. And then the water is turned to wine. And in verse 10, the master of the feast remarks to the bridegroom and he says, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior but you have kept the good wine until now. So every man in the beginning sets out the good wine. And what this says to me is that every man in the beginning is filled with his good intentions. We're going to circle back around, and I'm going to explain why the lacking of wine represents the failure of a religion without relationship. Every man in the beginning sets out the good wine. In other words, every man in the beginning has very good intentions. They want to serve God. They want to perform good works. And they'll even do many things in his name. And yet, trying to do things in the name of Jesus without having a relationship with Jesus, without the new birth, which we will study next week, that if you're not born again, if you're not born of the Spirit, you can't understand the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God. So to try and please God on the basis of your righteousness and on the basis of your works, on the basis of what you believe is pleasing to God instead of what the Holy Spirit reveals as his will, is the same as every man who in the beginning sets out the good wine. You try and you hope and you labor, and you toil, and this is mostly in the realm of religion, where we are trying to please God on the basis of good works and good intentions. And yet, every man in the beginning sets out the good wine, but you see what happens, eventually the wine runs out. And to me, this represents the failure of religion without relationship. It's very possible that you can have a religion about Jesus and yet not have a relationship with Jesus. And so you are like the empty water pots. You are like the wine that runs out. And so they have no wine. Now, the interesting thing is every man sets out the good wine in the beginning, just like Peter, who said to the Lord, Even if everybody else denies you and falls away from you, I will never deny you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. And Jesus said to Peter that before the rooster crowed three times, he would deny him three times. So we all have good intentions, but the fact 
of the matter is that we cannot serve God based on good intentions, based on our effort, based on our good works. That is the same as trying to please God and trying to save yourself. So it's interesting that in the beginning we are taught, hopefully, that we can't save ourselves, but we trust in the Lord to do in us and through us what we have finally realized we are not capable of doing, which is we can't save ourselves. And yet at some point someone comes along after we've been saved and tells you there there are all these things that you have to do now in order to live up to your salvation, to keep your salvation. And the difference between religion and relationship is, yes, there are many things that we do to interact and to live within the relationship that we have with the Lord and with one another. But the difference is we're not doing them to try and earn our salvation We're not doing it because we're trying to achieve a certain place in heaven. And we certainly can't save ourselves by our works. But instead, our works, our fruit, proves that we have been saved already and that God has saved us for good works. Not because of good works, but for good works that he has called us to. So we want to be careful not to take the position that now that you are saved, now that you have entered into the gate, there's nothing else for you to do but just sit back, bask in the presence of God, just suntan and drink lemonade, and there's nothing else to be done, nothing else for you to do because Jesus did it all. Well, Jesus did it all in the sense that he died, he was crucified, He was raised, and he paid the penalty for our sins. Jesus did it all in terms of our salvation. But in terms of discipleship, in terms of our spiritual growth and maturity, there is work to be done. There's a stewardship that we are responsible for. There is a mission that he has called us to, to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to make disciples, not to make decisions for Christ, but to make disciples for Christ. And so it's important to get through the gate, to come to the Lord. But beyond that gate, Jesus says there is a narrow path. So there's the narrow gate, and then there's the narrow path, and the life is at the end of of the path. It's not at the beginning of the path. You must enter the gate and then you must walk the path. So every man in the beginning sets out the good wine with good intentions, with good works, and yet falls short of the glory of God. It's unsustainable in your own power. It's unsustainable in your own strength. And this is why God calls us to take up the cross and follow after Jesus. As we are decreased, it says, he is increased. And even though the outward man is perishing, even though the outward man is weak, the inward man, it says, is becoming stronger day by day. So, when Jesus changed the water into wine. It says that in verse 11 that he manifested his glory or he revealed his glory. And you recall when we began this study in John 1, it says that we beheld his glory. We saw his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And here it says, when the water was turned to wine, that in this sign, Jesus manifested his glory. He showed forth his glory. He revealed his glory. Well, what is the glory that is revealed in this sign? Why is this significant? Why is it important? And what about... This reveals 
something of Christ and something of his glory as the Son of God? Well, there are four areas, or in, well, we could say four dimensions in which Jesus reveals his glory here when he turns the water to wine. The first is that Jesus brings fullness out of emptiness. Fullness out of emptiness. So you have these six pots of water, or the six water pots, I should say, because the six pots of water didn't have water in them. So they weren't six pots of water. They were just six empty vessels. So out of this emptiness, Jesus brings fullness. He commands that these empty pots be filled, that these vessels be filled. And it brings to mind when Elijah was helping the widow woman and she needed money to pay her debts and to care for her son and for herself. And Elijah said, go and find all the empty vessels. And she did. And she began to pour the last bit of oil she had into the empty vessels. And she filled all the empty vessels until there were no more vessels. And as soon as she filled all the vessels that she had, the oil stopped flowing. So with that miracle, she was able to take all of the oil and sell it and pay her her debts and provide for her and for her son. But the lesson from that is that God requires an empty vessel so that he can fill it with his fullness. If a vessel is full, it cannot be filled. If a vessel is already full, it cannot be filled. And the problem with so many believers and so many uh, people that I come into contact with is they are so full of themselves, <laughs> full of themselves, full of their opinions, full of their reasonings, full of their arguments, and it's impossible to teach them. It's impossible to, re to show them anything. It's impossible for them to get new revelation. It's impossible for God to fill them. Why? Because they are already so full of themselves. God requires us to be emptied of ourselves, and then he can pour in, first of all, the water. And the water it represents life. When he said, fill those empty vessels with water, this represents the new birth. This represents salvation. We find in the book of Revelation that there is a river of life flowing out from the throne that flows out and that there are fruit, uh, the tree of life growing on either side, producing fruit. And the leaves of those trees are for the healing of the nations. But water represents the life of God here. So first, God requires an empty vessel. Jesus says to fill the water pots with water. That water represents life. And then somewhere in the process, that water is transformed into wine. And that wine represents the fruit of the vine. When the Jews pray and bless their wine during the meal. The blessing over that cup, over that wine, is blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And the fruit of the vine is the wine. So this wine represents the abundance, the joy, of the abiding life, the indwelling life. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me, he who lives in me, the one who continues to live in me. That's what abide means. Not in and out, not here one day and gone the next, but abiding, continuing to dwell. The one who continues to live in me will produce much fruit, and your fruit will remain. So wine is representative of the joy of the Lord, and it represents the fruit of the Spirit as well. 
So the fruit of the Spirit becomes the wine. The water is turned into wine. And this all represents the spiritual growth and maturity of the disciple. We all begin as empty vessels. And then God fills us with water, which is the water of life, the new birth. And then as we take up the cross and follow after Jesus, the water of life is turned into wine, which represents the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the outward manifestation, the outward revealing of the inward life. Jesus says you will know them by their fruit, not by the words. We put so much stock in what a person says. And what a person says is very important, but what they do is even more important. And Jesus says it's by their fruit that you will know them. So in Galatians 5, it tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. And these different aspects of fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth, All of these things are the outward manifestations, the outward character that's being revealed. It is Christ inside of a person, the life of God, the water of life that has turned into wine in a person. That's a mysterious process. Tell me at what point here in John chapter 2 was the water turned to wine? Well, somewhere between the time that they filled it up with water and then they took a sample of it out to take to the master. At some point, there hidden in that vessel, the water was miraculously turned into wine. And not just any old wine. Again, this is the difference between the ordinary wine and the really good wine. Because the master of the feast tasted the wine, the new wine that Jesus made, and didn't know where it came from. And he said, you know, everyone else sets out the good wine and then they bring out the inferior wine, but you've kept the best until last. So this is the real thing. This is the real fruit of the Spirit here. And religion can never, ever duplicate that. The best that religion can come up with is a poor imitation of the fruit of the Spirit, inferior wine that runs out. But the wine which is produced by the one who continues to live in Christ and continues to abide in the vine and produces the fruit and produces the fruit of the vine, which is the wine, it is sweet and it's best and it's better than anything that can be manufactured or created by religion. The fruit of your religion is not to be compared with the fruit of a spirit-filled life. So the life of God fills us with water. The Holy Spirit fills us with the fruit of the vine, which is wine. The water, the life, leads us to the fruit of the vine. So in this Jesus reveals his glory because only he can bring fullness out of emptiness. Secondly, he reveals his glory by bringing glory out of shame. In other words, he's making up for the lack here. It's an embarrassment. It's a shameful thing that you've invited all of these guests to the wedding And in spite of your good intentions, in spite of your careful planning, you're still going to come up short. And so it brings a a certain embarrassment upon the whole celebration. The whole celebration now is it has a shadow cast upon it because they are they have run out of wine. And so Jesus brings glory out of our shame. The shame when we come up short. The shame when we miss the mark. The shame when we sin and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus makes up for the lack with his grace and with his love and with his forgiveness. Now Mary came to him, the mother of Jesus, and said that they had no wine. But what she's trying to do here is help out the help out the situation and try to get Jesus involved, 
And Jesus tells her, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. There's more to this than simply trying to help out a friend who's in a, a who is in an embarrassing situation. And Mary is looking at this and saying, well, Jesus, can you help us out here? They don't have any wine. I know that you can do a miracle. But Jesus will not do miracles simply because his mother asks him to, only because his father asks him to and leads him and says, yes, reveal your glory here in this situation. But you may be wondering, well, why did Jesus speak this way to his mother? And all all this conversation means is he's trying to lift this up out of just a natural thing that happened. Well, here's a wedding. They ran out of wine. Jesus, can you help us out? And the point of this is that he only he only will show forth his glory when the Father leads him to do so, and he will not simply perform a sign that does not in some way reveal something of his own nature, that does not reveal his glory, so that he can lead us and point us to the Father, since he is the way to the Father, the truth, and the life. So, He will only act and he will only take action if his father leads him to do so and if his father can use this for his glory. So in this, in meeting our need and in making up for our lack, it's not just about us and getting our needs met. It's about the glory of the Lord being revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. In this, it says that he showed forth his glory. So he brings glory out of shame. He makes up for our shortcomings. He makes up for our lack. And in fact, he responds in situations where we have come to the very end of our resources. He is waiting for us to come to the end of our resources so that he can do what he is best at, which is bringing glory and honor out of our shame. The third way in which he reveals his glory here is he brings joy out of sorrow. Joy out of sorrow. The marriage supper is supposed to be a time of celebration It's a time of great joy, uh, and that whole joy was threatened by the fact that they ran out of wine. We said that wine represents joy. It says in Psalm 104 that God gave wine to gladden the hearts of men. Again, if you drink too much wine and get too much gladness and happiness, you're going to be in trouble. But in moderation, it says that God gave wine to gladden the hearts of men. So wine, maybe you want to take that in a spiritual context, but this was real wine that Jesus multiplied here or that Jesus changed from water into real drinkable wine. But it represents the joy that Jesus brings out of our sorrow. By turning this situation around, he brings joy out of sorrow. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's always interesting to me, Paul's last words to the Ephesian elders in the book of Acts. When he's leaving them, he says that his goal is to finish the race with joy. And I've pointed out before in in other places that God's best and, and, and God's highest purpose for us is not just to finish the race, not just to stumble across the finish line all out of breath and collapse at the end and say, well, I finished the race. Thank God that's over. But to finish the race with joy. Now that, 
sets a higher standard, a higher goal than merely finishing the race, but to finish the race with joy. In other words, if I could say to die with a smile on our face, that we fought a good fight. Not just that we fought, but we fought a good fight. We put up a good fight. (laughs) Not just that we fought, but we put up a good fight. We ran the race. We finished the race with joy, and we kept the faith. We were faithful to the testimony of Jesus until the very end. That's what it means to finish the race with joy. And Jesus reveals his glory by bringing joy out of sorrow. All of the negative experiences of our life, all of the sorrow that we have experienced, all the sadness that we have experienced, Jesus reveals his glory in us and through us. In our weakness, he reveals strength. In our sorrow, he reveals joy. And in this, he reveals his glory. And finally, this whole episode represents how Jesus reveals his glory by bringing life out of death. Remember, all of this happened on the third day, and it's on the third day that Jesus rose from the dead. So this whole marriage feast, this whole celebration represents resurrection. You come to the end of what you are able to do and then you run out of wine. And then out of that emptiness, Jesus brings fullness. Out of that shame, Jesus brings glory. Out of that sorrow, Jesus brings joy. And out of that symbolic death, Jesus brings life. It says that you have kept the best for last. And we see in the plan and purpose of God that God indeed is keeping and reserving the best for last. When we try to make sense of the pain and sufferings and things that happen in this world, and we try to interpret them and understand them within the narrow time frame of earth, the narrow time frame of our life, may I say to you that it does not make sense. Many of the things we see, we don't understand. We don't comprehend why bad things happen to good people. We don't understand why the righteous suffer and the wicked seem to get away with everything. And the reason we can't fathom it is because it can't be resolved completely to our satisfaction within this narrow time frame of our days and our years on earth. We must understand that the purpose and plan of God is not limited to our time here on earth. It says in the book of James that our life is but a vapor. We're just a fog here on this earth. This is just a an introduction to a much greater and larger eternity in which the plan and purpose of God will continue to be revealed and will be fulfilled. But it will not be fulfilled here in the history of earth and in your lifetime. This plan and this purpose of God is much greater and much larger, much too large and much too great to fit within the narrow time frame, the narrow construct of time as we know it. It is the eternal purpose of God, Scripture says. And because it is the eternal purpose of God, it means that it has its origin in eternity past and it has its fulfillment in eternity future. That means we can only see a portion of it. We can only experience a portion of it. So you're not going to get all the answers as to why the good suffer, why the righteous suffer and why the wicked prosper and why good things happen to bad people and why bad things happen to good people. You're not going to get answers to those questions in a way that will satisfy you. But here is where my satisfaction comes from and this is where 
you can find your satisfaction. The satisfaction is not in trying to resolve all of those issues to my understanding so that I can accept them here in this lifetime. Instead, my hope and my faith is in a great purpose and plan of God that began in eternity before time began and will continue to be revealed and will be fulfilled after time ceases, meaning it is in the realm of the spirit. It's in the realm of eternity. And one day it will make sense. (laughs) One day God is going to bring life out of death, and just as the master of the feast said, you have kept the best for last. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul declares that God in the ages to come will continue to reveal his loving kindness towards us in Christ. There are future dimensions and future ages in which Christ will continue to reveal his glory and we will continue to explore the great depths and the great heights and the great breadth and the great width and the great length of this Christ whom we serve and who lives in us. But it's going to take ages to come, Paul says. For this revelation to be re- continue to be revealed. And this is alluded to here in John chapter 2. You have kept the best for last. Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. You have kept the best for last. And it's only in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, that we see the final fulfillment of everything. And Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. And there's no more sorrow, no more crying, no more death, no more sickness, no more pain. Indeed, Lord, you have kept the best for last. And he brings life out of death. In all these things, Jesus has revealed his glory. So, we come now to the second half of John chapter 2. And this has to do with Jesus presenting himself in the temple. And so we begin reading again. Let's go back to verse 13 of John 2. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Notice the three days again. So see how the wedding in Cana took place on the third day? And here again, the third day is mentioned when Jesus says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, you may not immediately see the connection between these two stories, but let's look at these two events here 
happening in John chapter 2, bearing in mind that everything John writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has some kind of a significance, some kind of meaning. So let's look and see why these two events were chosen to be related side by side and what they may be telling us. Well, first, it says that Jesus went to the temple during the time of Passover. Well, Passover represents the annual feast when the scapegoat was offered up for the sins of the people. It was part of the Mosaic law. So by going up to Jerusalem for the Passover, and Jesus would have done this annually from the time that he was a child, but the fact that he went up and it mentions specifically that it was Passover and that Jesus went up to Jerusalem, it foreshadows the crucifixion and death of Jesus. And eventually it's going to show us the resurrection as well. But in the meantime, it says that he went into the temple and he saw the the money changers and he saw those who were selling the oxen and the sheep and the doves and the business of religion being carried out. And so once again, this whole scene represents the failure, the failure, the failure of organized religion. It represents the failure of a religion without a relationship so that they didn't even recognize Jesus as the Son of God. They didn't recognize his glory. And they didn't honor the house of God. They didn't honor the temple of God. Instead, they had turned it into a house of merchandise. So it says that Jesus drove them out with a whip and he overturned their tables. And this, to me, represents a revolutionary act. It represents bringing in a new heavenly order. Out with the old and in with the new. It's time to do some spring cleaning here, Jesus says. And he drove them out with a whip. And he says, get these things out. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. So then, of course, they were offended. And they wanted to know, by whose authority do you do these things? What sign do you show us? And so Jesus said something very, very remarkable. He says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And of course, they looked at it with their carnal understanding and says, well, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple. How will you raise it up in three days? And so obviously they didn't understand it. But it says he was speaking of the temple of his body. He was referring to his resurrection. Therefore, it says when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again on the third day. That represents resurrection. Now, again, they defended their building, 46 years it took to build this temple. And even in relating the years, you can hear the pride and the arrogance of the religious machine. 46 years built the temple. This church has been here for 100,000 years. Our denomination is the largest in the world. (laughs) But you hear the pride there. So they're defending the building even after they have turned the building into a den of thieves. Yet they are defending the building because if they don't defend the building, then they don't have a business because that's what the religious machine depends upon. It thrives on the business. the business of selling sacrifices, the business of selling indulgences, the business of buying favors. 
And so they didn't understand what he meant, of course, and they were offended. Now, the connection between Jesus cleansing the temple and Jesus changing the water to wine, the connection is this. Just as the good wine is given in the beginning, that every man sets out the good wine in the beginning, every man in the beginning has good intentions with the religion that he builds, with the building of churches and with the building of temples and with the construction of things that seem to give glory to God. Just as every man sets out good wine in the in the beginning, so every religious system, every denomination, every church, every home group, every Bible study begins with good intentions. But it's just like Peter on the mountain of transfiguration. He had good intentions, but he didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us build for you. Let us build for you. Let us build for you. And no one asked Peter to build anything for Jesus. Peter wanted to build three tabernacles there. One for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And among other things, what that, what that really said is, we're going to put Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah. And maybe they thought that that was honoring Jesus. But that's not honoring Jesus to put him on the same level as Moses and Elijah. Let's build three tabernacles for you. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Well, in the first place, the Most High does not live in dwellings and in temples made by human hands. So Peter is taking a step back here when he's trying to contain the glory of the Lord into a tabernacle, into a dwelling, into a building. And it's no different than every man setting out good wine in the beginning but eventually it's going to run out and the good intentions can't last. And just as the the wine ran out, so the glory soon departed from the temple. There's no glory of God in this temple. Jesus says, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. So the wine ran out. And the glory soon departed. And so these events are telling us the same thing. That just as Jesus turned the water into wine, so he will turn his very body into a new temple. A temple made without hands. A living house of God. For he is the house. He is the temple. He is the body. And just as he turned the water into wine and revealed his glory, he reveals his glory by turning his body into the new temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and gathers us as his living stones into his own house. I will build my ecclesia, he says. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and nobody will be able to defile, and nobody will be able to set up shop, and nobody will be able to turn this new temple into a den of thieves. So when man does the best that he can and he falls short of the glory of God, again Jesus steps in and demonstrates his glory, reveals his glory, manifests his glory, that he is the Son of God. So he says, destroy this temple. If the wine runs out, I'll change the water into wine. And if you destroy this temple, I'll change my body into a new temple, a temple of the Holy Spirit. So in both the wedding at Cana and in the cleansing of the temple, we see that even when man does his best, he falls short of the glory of God. In Jesus, we see the glory of the Son of God, that he will take the shortcomings of man 
and he will bring forth a greater good in the end. When the wine fails, he will bring forth that which is sweeter and better. And when the temple fails, he will raise up another temple, a spiritual house of living stones that will endure forever. In verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And even in this brief footnote, we see the glory of God revealed in Christ because scripture declares that no one can know the heart of a man except God. Only God sees the heart and he judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart while every other man judges by the outward appearance. But here it says that Jesus knew what was in man. Why? Because he is more than a man. He is the Son of God. And all things, it says in Hebrews, is naked, are naked and open unto him as our high priest. He sees all and he knows all. And this, again, is the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to find out more about the School of Christ and how to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at www.theschoolofchrist.org. 